In today's episode of Highly Sensitive Money, we dive deep into the complexities of money, generosity, and conflict in relationships. Joining me today is Lily, our very first highly sensitive person guest who openly shares her personal money story and journey as an HSB. We explore the intertwining of her upbringing, financial anxiety, and the impact of past relationships on her perception of money and generosity. Lily shares her experiences of feeling the need to be financially independent, the impact of past financial abuse, and the challenges of giving and receiving without feeling beholden or taken advantage of. We uncover how being highly sensitive can shape one's relationship with money and the difficulty in finding a balance between independence and interdependence. We delve into the vulnerability that comes with being generous and receiving generosity, exploring the internal dialogue around motives and expectations. Lily reflects on the difficulty of trusting oneself to navigate financial interactions and the impact of societal trust in uncertain times. Our conversation leads to a moment of clarity for Lily as she recognizes her own patterns and beliefs around money, paving the way for personal growth and self-reflection. We discuss the capacity to tolerate conflict when it comes to money and the potential for healthy conflict resolution in relationships. Lily is an actor, writer, and comedian who has toured her full comedy tour, The Lily Show, to DC, LA, and Atlanta. You can find her on Instagram at Lily Kerrigan Presents or on YouTube as Lily Kerrigan. Lily, I'm so excited to have you here joining as our first guest, as our first highly sensitive person guest who's willing to share their money story. I was mentioning that I'm so grateful that you're taking the time to to share about money because it's such a private topic and also to share about what it's like for you to be an HSB. Lily and I met at a, at a mindfulness group for women. It was virtual during the pandemic. And since then, we've just we've got, gotten to know each other. We met in person finally about a month ago in Atlanta. And that was lovely. And that's where we started talking more about HSP. So, so welcome, Lily. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be chatting. Me too. I'm excited to have you have you on and happy Thanksgiving. We're recording the day after Thanksgiving. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Black Friday. Yeah. It's a good money. It's a good day to talk it's about money. It's a good money, day to right? talk about money. Yeah. <laughs> and finances and why we spend <laughs> what we spend. And yeah. So let's get started. Do you want to share a little bit like, where do you want to start? Do you want to start talking about what it's like to be an HSP or your money background? Where does it feel most natural? Well, I think I can kind of intertwine them because I think for me growing up, my mother had come from poverty. Essentially, the way she describes it is that they always knew they would have food, but there was never any extra. And that was the childhood she grew up with was like, there's not extra. There's not a feeling of abundance. There's just like we can meet our needs and we're grateful for that. She managed to move up in class. I had like a, a middle class background and a middle class life, but she still carried a lot of that generational anxiety and and that trauma. I think because I was such a sensitive little kid, I picked up on that in a way that maybe not everybody would because you know, I never had to like worry about not having enough food or anything like that. And I think my parents did, were certainly not trying to instill any type of financial anxiety in me. But because I was just sort of aware that money was like always, always a scary thing and that like it could go away at any time. And that I also developed a sense early on that like if you had the money, then you could make your own decisions. And if you didn't, then you couldn't. And I think because of my own various pathologies, and I think some of that is being very sensitive to being told what to do. That's a big thing for me is that like, I want to be in control. and I want to you know, be able to be in control of my own destiny and my own fate and everything. And so I've always felt like I need to have, I need to have the money. I need to have good earning power. I need to not be asking for anything because I don't want to be weak and I don't want anyone to be able to tell me what to do. And I and I think that that is a real thing that I do see with my friends who like are more financially intertwined with their parents or whatever or with a partner that the great thing is that they don't have this intense burden of self-reliance that I put on myself. 
they're much freer and more relaxed in a lot of ways. But it also means that then when it comes to like their partner who's financially supporting them says, well, my job is moving me across the country. They don't really have the ability to be like, well, no, I'm staying here. Or their parents will say, will, you know, disapprove of something in their lives and they'll feel a pressure to change or to or that it like causes tension in that relationship. And then that then is exacerbated by money. So I've I've definitely felt like having my own money is a way of knowing that I won't ever have to bend to anyone else's whims. I also was in a very bad, very scary relationship for a few years. And one of the things that he would do is he would like take money from me. Um, He sometimes by like putting my credit card in on his account, he would just like sort of steal my information or he would just say like, well, I'm not going to be paying rent this month. So you got to you have to pay for both of us. It was a very like financially abusive as well as abusive in other ways relationship. I think in that relationship, which also informed a lot of my anxieties around money and anxieties generally, part of the way that I could protect myself from his like mood swings and his outbursts was by giving him money. Because he would sometimes that would be the way he would start a fight is he would say like I that he would complain that he didn't have enough money in part because his mood swings made it very hard for him to keep a job that he would often like quit impulsively and stuff like that he would complain that he didn't have enough money he would complain that I wasn't giving him enough money he would and he would like ramp up and start like getting really really worked up and really angry and the way that I saw to protect myself was just be like well here's a thousand dollars there you go like stop yelling at me I can't deal with this. Just like it just if mm-hmm. if you'll if you'll stop this like emotional roller coaster that we're on, I will I will I will pay to get off of it. That's something mm-hmm. that I still find myself having some remnants of that that like I see paying for stuff as a way to get out of conflict. Even if I feel like the balance isn't exactly fair, I see it as like, well, I'll just pay for everything and then no one will be fighting and no one will be mad and no one can be mad at me. Those are I would say those are like the main ways that being a highly sensitive person and my personal relationship with money have like intersected over my life. Okay. So one of the things that, and thank you for for sharing so much and sharing so openly. One of the last things that you said was pain to get out of conflict and that that's something that you continue to see for myself too as an HSP. It's like, I'm always just amazed at how people feel unfazed by things that move me to tears. And I'm like, wow, they're just, they keep walking. How is this possible? I'm imagining you see conflict more easily than other people around you. Are you trying to separate like conflict avoidance with pain money? I kind of heard that as an undertone, but I'm not sure if that's, or maybe that's a skill you want to continue to have, right? To just buy your way out of distress. I think. It's sort of twofold that I'm I I am working on getting to a place where I am capable of tolerating healthy conflict. There's sort of a natural bell curve that like some people really thrive in high conflict environments and some people mm. are a little more conflict avoidant or want to find ways that everyone can win. I've gone so far to the end of the bell curve that I find it hard to advocate for myself. That's something that I'm working on that not that I necessarily want more conflict, but that I want to have tools in my arsenal other than just like whatever everyone else can have what they want I don't care I'll just go into a corner now you might have the same thing that because conflict takes so much more out of me than it does out of the average person that there's like a really strong incentive to inv- to avoid it that other people seem to sort of be able to bounce back from conflict a little more quickly like they sleep it off or they go on a walk or whatever and they're able to like let it go and I find that I'm much more likely to like ruminate on it and carry it and feel like I need to change my behavior in the future so that this never happens again. I don't know if you feel the same way. No, it, it is it is true. I definitely find myself like if there's a potential for conflict, I tend to avoid it. I tend to isolate. Um, but I hadn't thought of how having money could be a way to avoid it. And that the situation that you were describing with your ex-partner, that's that's definitely financial abuse. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very thankful that I'm like seven years away from that relationship. But one of the things with abusive relationships is you keep sort of discovering layers to the abuse. When you first get out, you're just like, this is amazing. I am no longer an active danger. This is wonderful. Then you sort of spend a lot of time kind of peeling back all the layers of like, oh, well, that was kind of messed up. Oh, that was really messed up. Wait, that's not how normal people behave. 
especially having been in a much more, a very like healing and positive relationship for the past seven years, it's given me really good context for like, oh no, that, that past relationship was not normal. I think that people are, are just barely beginning to become aware of financial abuse and, and what it looks like and, and how it manifests. And I think it's a lot more common than than we're necessarily aware of. It definitely is common. I do work with people who have come out of financial abuse and I'm able to go slowly because that's the thing. There's some layers of grief. And I don't know if this was the case for you, but I've seen some of my clients shame. Like, I can't believe that I stayed in this situation for as long as I did. It's progressive, you know, kind of like that idea of like they're boiling a frog. Yes. The intensity slowly grows. And next thing you know, you're doing things that you wouldn't have accepted a year ago. It just grows. And there's so many parts going on that I can, money is part of it, but the abuse is the main thing. Right, yeah. right. Because financial abuse almost never exists as like the one axis of abuse. Usually there's a lot of them. I have a hard time sharing money in my current relationship, even in a healthy way. And my my current partner is really lovely and supportive. And it's just like, hey, if you want to split everything 50-50, that's totally cool. Like, we can split it down to the cent if that's what makes you comfortable. That's totally fine. I would like to be able to be a little more generous. But I think because I have that trauma from the financial abuse, there's a part of my brain that has like an irrational association between being generous and being taken advantage of. Okay. Do you want to look at that? Yes. I'm, I'm nervous, but, but yes, I feel ready to look at it. Yeah. Okay. So... The relationship between being generous and being taken advantage of. Do you have any experiences where you've received generosity? Hmm. I, my, some of my grandparents helped, and my parents paid for my college. That was, I think, the biggest act of generosity. I got some scholarships, but other than that, my parents and grandparents were able to cover my college. Mm -hmm. What was it like to receive that generosity? What's interesting is the main emotion that's like coming up right now is like guilt. Like I didn't deserve it. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah, that that's and that feels illogical. Like I feel like I should be more like grateful. But really what I feel is like, oh, I didn't deserve it. Someone else would have deserved it more. It's not fair that I got this when other people didn't. There's like a lot of like guilt and shame that like. I had, I got this and I didn't, that I, like, I feel unworthy of it. Mm -hmm. That it was somehow unearned. Yes. Yeah. That it was unearned. Yeah. I'll share my experience yeah. because I got out of college debt free. My parents divorced a couple of years before I went to school and my mom's income plummeted. So because I had good grades, everything mm -hmm. was paid for. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and I could was... be so happy for you to have that experience of graduating debt-free. And for myself, I'm like, oh, I didn't deserve it. It was the luck of the draw. Like, my yeah. brain was set up in a way where I enjoyed school and yes. I was very, like, diligent about it. And my parents, my mom had very little income, right? So, like, me going to school was actually a benefit to her because it was, like, one less mouth to feed. There was one less person in the house. The whole experience of, of knowing that I didn't, I didn't do anything specifically great to have this good thing handed to me, that sensitivity to inequality, I wonder if it has to do with being an HSP, but I also wonder how it can continue to affect the way that you see receiving generosity and giving generosity. If you're sensitive to the problems in the world, then you're going to be sensitive to wealth inequality and the fact that some people get more than others and it's not fair, as opposed to people who aren't looking at the world critically or aren't sensitive to those issues are much more likely to have their blinders on and be like, well, I got this because I deserve it. I agree that there's something going on for me that I am not able to give generously and I'm also not able to receive gratefully. Mm -hmm. Both of those things are interconnected and I don't, and I don't really know how to shift them. When you talked earlier about how you saw having access to money as a way for independence, right, that you see peers that are more intertwined with their parents, so that giving and receiving. Yes. Yeah, that I feel like it's it's almost like a, a I don't, 
I guess a brooch of my independence maybe is a good way to say it. It almost feels like a chink in the armor. I have this image of myself. It's like being very independent that that engaging in even like healthy interdependence is maybe harder for me than it is for a more healthy person. Well, and it doesn't even have to be about pathologizing your experience, right? Sometimes when you're bringing to awareness something that's no longer working, we just get to sit with that part of where you are. Yeah. Right? How's that landing? I saw you could take a big sigh. I did. Yeah. It's, I have an urge to like fix my own stuff. And so just sitting with it sometimes is like a good reminder. And also just like, yeah, I'm not, I do just really have a lot of anxiety, both around giving and receiving that I don't want to be like an unworthy recipient. And I also don't want to be taken advantage of. And that sort of having like the wall up and like drawing a circle around myself and being like, well, I'm an independent person is sort of the way that I have coped with that sort of pain almost of like, yeah, having a lot of issues with, with generosity, both giving and receiving. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, yeah. I hadn't really thought about it like that before or, but yeah, that's definitely hard for me. As we're talking about this subject, is there anything going on in your body? I feel almost like a pit in my stomach and like anxious feeling in my chest. I can feel like my heart is, is really beating. Okay. Can we do a little bit of somatics? Yeah, let's do it. I'm here for it. So I saw you kind of like pull up your chest. That's great. Bring your attention to your feet. Just see where your feet are. If you're comfortable, you can close your eyes. Just see how your feet are being held up by the floor without any effort on your part. Checking with your breathing, whether it's shallow, whether it's deep, however it shows up is the right way. Any yawning, any stretches that need to happen. That's great. That's a great sigh. Yeah, I'm like, as I'm sensing in, I can feel how much is going on in my neck and my chest and like, it's all like tightening up and I'm just trying to focus on my feet. Yeah. And now bring the focus from your feet. Slowly, let's do a body scan the way we do in our mindfulness class. We're slowly going to move up both legs, your lower legs to your knees, to your thighs, to your butt on the seat. And again, sense how the seat is holding you up without any effort on your part. And bring your attention up your core to your belly, to your back, to your chest. We're now going to bring the attention down your shoulders, to your arms, to your hands. Check in with your hands to see if there's any kind of tension there. It's often where we hold a lot of tingly energy. And we're going to jump now to your head. And sense the front of your face. Sense the air on your face. And now let's consider your entire body. From your feet to the back of your head. Just have all of it in your awareness. Know that you're here, you're in it. And see what it might be wanting to share. As you feel comfortable, you can open your eyes. When you said the thing about what does your body want to share, 
the thing that came over me was this feeling of like tiredness that I am like tired Mm -hmm. of having to be an independent entity and not being able to ask anybody for anything that it's exhausting sometimes Mm -hmm. so your body's tired of being so independent yes yes and it's tired of always feeling like I have to pay everything back that some of it is that I realized that another big act of generosity was my partner owns a house and for a while I was living with him and not paying rent and I felt like I had to do a lot around the house like clean everything and declutter and reorganize like I did all the cooking and everything all the grocery shopping because I was like, oh, I, I have to pay this back. Like, I can't just receive it. And I think that's another thing that's coming up is I have to pay everything back. And just always, always. have feeling I have to do that is just so tiring. I, I never get to just be like, wow, that's so nice that someone did that for me. Thank you. It's exhausting sometimes. And Lily, so you voiced at the beginning how being independent, having access to your money. And we talked once before in an Instagram live and you talked about how diligent you are at saving, right? So you've seen the very positive side of having financial independence. And it looks like you're hitting a place where you're looking at the the exhausting side of being independent. Yeah. Yeah, that it's wonderful in that like no one can tell me what to do. That's just like my big thing. But then the downside is that it can feel lonely and that it it feels sometimes i'm trying to put this into words is there a memory or an image or a story that comes up i i'm not getting like a full no. memory but just, but just a little just snippet little. of just okay I think this might have been about when my current partner and I were going to couples therapy and that he was like not jazzed about going for the first time and now he's like very happy to be in therapy he recognizes that it's a wonderful tool but he definitely had some blocks around it and then I was like well I'll pay for it like I'll just I'll pay for and then like what's your problem? Like I'm paying for it. And that I'm try. I'm not totally sure exactly how it's connected to everything else, but it, for some reason, that's the thing that's coming up. And I'm trusting that you, because you're listening to me rather than living my life, you can probably see the connections very clearly. And I'm just struggling to make them myself. Well, the thing that I heard with your tone of voice, this might be right or wrong, but you said, I'm paying for it. There's nothing for him to say. He has no say in the matter yes. because you're paying for it. So when someone's paying for you, you might think because they're paying, because they're paying the rent, because they're allowing me to go to or making it possible for me to go to college, I have no say in the matter. Yes. Yes. See, there. it's so good to have somebody who's listening. And I can hear the the bananas things you're saying. I mean, it's I have always tell people like it's impossible to see the spinach in our own teeth. Yes, like, I go to money coaches because I can't see the spinach in my teeth. It's not it's not anything magical. It's I won't put myself down. I'm just like watching myself put my. But it is it is kind of like that's what I heard in your tone of voice. Yes, yes. That on some level, I feel that that's the deal you make when you accept money. Is that either you're basically paying to have your own way or you are being paid to give someone else their way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you heard of Katie? I think her last name is Byron. The four questions. Oh, the four questions sounds familiar, but Katie Byron doesn't. So I don't know. Or Byron Katie. I think that's her name. Okay, that's her name. I don't remember them exactly word for word, but they've been popping up in my mind a couple of times during our conversation. And the first question is, is it true? Is it true that when someone pays for you, 
you have to do what they're saying that you have to do? Is it true that when you pay for someone else, they have to do what you're telling them to do? Is it true that payment takes away the other person's agency? It's not 100% true. Like definitely when you lay it out in black and white, it's not 100% true. But there's a part of me that does really feel it's a little true. It's maybe like 5%, 10% true that you do give up some agency when you accept money. Well, when you accept to be someone's partner, don't you give up some agency? That's a good way of thinking of it. Yes, that there's a difference between agreeing to engage in mutual decision making versus giving someone else their way. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way to think of it, that like when you accept money, you might have to engage in some mutual decision making but that it is still a process of engagement rather than of domination. The incursion. Yes. Right? And it and it makes sense, like given the the financial abuse that you had in your previous relationship, right? And also that that like small theme of scarcity that you grew up with of like money scary, money has to be like you have to have your mind independence. It makes sense that now it's coming up and you're it seems like you're outgrowing the more black and white thinking around interdependence? Yes. Yeah, I am. And of course, because all things are connected, this is also something I've been working a lot in therapy is that I have kind of the same thing emotionally, that I can be very much like, I'm not going to ask anyone to take care of me because then they're going to feel like I owe them something. Or like, I'm not, if other people express a preference, like, I'll just go with it because it's just not worth having conflict. And so I can now see that sort of mirrored in my relationship with money where I can get very black and white and I can feel like there's no room for give and take. Mm -hmm. And you said it beautifully. I wish I'd written it down. But like when you decide to give to someone, it can be mutually agreed upon. What, What were the words? Do you remember the phrase that you said? Oh, golly. What did I say? I think a mutually agreed upon partnership. Was maybe what I said. So I don't remember either. But having that be something that you lean towards in your money decisions and your mutual money decisions, how do you think framing it that way? Like, like when you're sh- well, what about your term? What about the idea of sharing? Right? Because you said that it's hard to receive and it's hard to give. What about sharing? Sharing, I'm realizing that in some ways that's also hard. Like I can split things. I can say like, oh, well, we've, well, like we're both eating the groceries. We'll split them 50-50 or whatever. But genuinely sharing is hard for me that I... I have a hard time not keeping track in my head Mm -hmm. and having everything split down to like the scent is, is a way of like assuring myself like that everything is fair and I'm not taking advantage of anyone and no one's taking advantage of me, but it's definitely not as like relaxed as some people are able to be in their sharing that like there's a difference between splitting and sharing and I'm definitely splitting things. I don't know how much I'm sharing. And is that something that you want? Do you want to bring more relaxation into the way that you give and receive? I don't necessarily know that I want to change anything about what I'm literally doing in the literal transactions. I would like to not feel anxious and stressed out and neurotic about them. Like, it's not that I necessarily need to do anything differently, but I would like to feel differently. Mm -hmm. So the keeping track, right? The mental space that's coming up with keeping track. Yes. Yeah. And the time that can go into that. Like, there was a, a period of like a month where like Matt had brought some groceries and I had bought others and then I paid for this ticket and then he paid for that thing. And 
Matt was like, I mean, honestly, I don't think we really need to do our finances this month. Like, cause I think it all comes out in the wash. Like, I think we were pretty much even. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to do this. And I like, I made my little spreadsheet and I laid everything out and I organized it. And at the end of it, it was like, maybe we were like $2 off from each other. They're like, they're like. It was so small, and I, like, made this such a, like, a time-consuming and stressful task for myself when Matt was able to just sort of eyeball it and be like, oh, yeah, I think we're pretty much even. I was like, no, we have to do the exact math. Mm -hmm. And that's, I would like to be able to be more like Matt and just go like, oh, yeah, I think that's pretty much even. Like, no worries on it. Like, I would like to be able to do that. Well, and have you... So you would like to have that, but have you seen that happen? Like, because sometimes at the beginning, it's like you do want to track all of it. You want to see that it's matching out. And then after a while, you see the pattern that you have. Have you experienced that at all? Hmm. Not because. Oh, go on. You might be getting more. I'm wondering if there may be ways that you're getting more relaxed without even knowing it. You know, Mm -hmm. I think we have definitely gotten more relaxed about, like, treats and, like, going out type thing. That very often, if we go out to eat, he will pay. And very often, if we go to, like, an event or the theater, that I will pay. And so that's definitely a place that we have gotten more relaxed is that we both have the things that we generally like to treat the other person to. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to like groceries or other necessity type things, we'll split them 50, 50. And then there will be things like I was the one who wanted to come visit my family in Missouri. So like I've been paying the expenses on that trip that like often if something is more important is like, Or rather, if something is only important to one of us, the person to whom it is important will pay for it. And is there anywhere in these transactions that you're feeling either taken advantage of or being beholden to him? Sometimes... I do feel a little beholden if he's bought food. But I also think that, like, all he really wants in those moments is for me to be excited. And that's something that I can do. Like, I'm very effusive with my gratitude and with my praise, in part because I want to keep buying me food. (laughs) Pretty easy to manipulate me. (laughs) He wants you to be happy about what you bought him. Right. And but what I'm hearing, so with your permission, what I'm hearing is that there is this is a very positive financial relationship, like mutually agreed upon. You're having a very positive experience in your romantic relationship when it comes to money. Yes. Yeah. He and I are very lucky that we really see eye to eye on money and that neither of us, like we both, it's hard to sentence and finish it. We're both of kind of similar mindsets And similar levels of resource. So I think it's easy for us to view money in the same way and not feel like we need to fight with each other about it. Like I can be very financially anxious on my own, but I never feel like that's a source of conflict with me. Okay. And he gives you space to do what you need. That's also something that I heard where he was like, "Eh, it's fine. I'm fine with it. But he saw that you needed to do a little bit more work. And he was like, well, here's the receipts. I'm imagining that he's like, here's what I paid. Here's the thing. Yes. Yeah. He's he humors me so much. I'm a very humored person, which is important, (laughs) I think, in a relationship that you get to be humored. I'm sure it's both ways in other areas of your life. Yeah, that's true. That we're both very silly people. (laughs) We both humor the other one a lot. So going back to the biggest act of generosity that you mentioned, right? Like receiving help to go to college. Have there been any negative repercussions from that? From your parents or your grandparents? 
No, no. I everything that I've felt with that has been like sort of like guilt looking at my peers that I know okay. not everyone else okay. got the same opportunity to be debt free when okay. they graduated. So it hasn't been towards there hasn't been any sense of being beholden by your parents or your grandparents. It's more about like when you look at the situation around you. Right. Yeah. And I guess the one thing is that my parents said that I had to double major because the major I wanted was theater. And they were like, well, you have to double major. And that was something that like I and, you know, I did college early. So like I was 12 years old and they were paying for college. So like I got a poli sci major and that actually worked out pretty well. Like it it was a decision that I didn't make on my own, but that actually helped me become a paralegal, which has been a good financial decision. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and also at that very young age of 12, I'm sure yes. your parents were making a lot of decisions a lot of about decisions a lot of things. Life. Yes. <laughs> so then you mentioned that the actual, when it comes specifically to the college thing, it's more about like looking at your peer situations. Yes, absolutely. That I feel sort of guilty for the resources that I've been given and then tying it back to the abusive relationship I was in, felt guilty that, like, I had been given a lot of advantages in life that he had not. And that I felt like I had to make up for that. And I felt like that made me, like, an easy target. That he was he was very good at, like, pushing that button of, like, well, you had this growing up and you had that growing up and I had this terrible childhood, so you have to do whatever. That's, like, a button that I have that, like, I'm... I'm very prone to guilt and I think I have a strong like also sense of justice, which is like a good thing to have, but that can that can absolutely be like taken advantage of and can spiral out of control. Yeah. And and yet here you are as a fully functioning adult. Yeah. There are ways that you've managed that that have been helpful. And there's also some there's beauty, right? There's beauty in being connected to justice. There's beauty in being connected to like how other people's experiences are and being able to sense it deeply. I remember when I've been researching HSPs, that's one of them. It's like, it's very common for HSPs, which are between 15 to 30 percent of the population to be deeply impacted by injustice. Which is good. We need more people in the world who feel impacted by injustice. Yeah. And one of the things that I love to remind people is that like individuals can't solve collective problems. I know, but I wish we could. Yeah. It doesn't mean we don't do anything. What? Yeah, but it, it doesn't mean, yeah. Oh, go on. Well, what, where is a meaningful place of action for you? Do you want to have meaningful action? Are you already doing it? I mean, are, how do you live social justice in your life? That's, a, that's another thing that I've been working on in therapy is like, what is enough? Because there's never going to be an amount of enough that I can personally do to fix ever I was going to say the world, but even America, like even, hey, even the state of Georgia, there is nothing that I can personally do that will even fix the city of Atlanta. But there are, there are ways that we can all organize together to make the world a better place, if not a perfect one. But it's. It's hard because you because you want every you want to be able to fix everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's also like the interdependence that we're being a call to step into, right? I remember I think it was there's a book called Decolonized Wealth by Edgar Villanueva, and he's talking about philanthropy. But there's something I mean that book was super helpful to me. But there's one portion where he talks about how we often think there's going to be like a savior, like one person's going to come and do something for all of us. But really a much more decolonized way of thinking about things or a much more what he calls indigenous for, for his culture. He's from North Carolina and I forget what, what tribe he's from. But he says like the collective, the community experience, right? So in your learning to be interdependent with money, that interdependent skill is going to be helpful in other parts. Right. Because that that mind, that mental tracking of like how much did each person do, it could kind of be I know for myself, sometimes I'm like that with relationships of like quid pro quo. If I have a crush on someone and I'm at a salsa place, I'm like, how many times is he dancing with me? How many times is he dancing with the other person? You know, I'm just like right. tracking yeah. it. I'm like, how useful is this? I should just tell the person I'm attracted to them, you know? <laughs> There's a much 
more direct way <laughs> of dealing with this. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's hard. It's hard to really be interdependent. It's like I feel as we're talking about it, like just like this feeling of like vulnerability because I'm because that's what interdependence requires. Is it requires yeah. that you be willing to be impacted by other people? Mm -hmm. And is that okay? Is vulnerability okay? Is that something you want? For people who are listening, you can see that I'm making a big face. Uh, and I am laughing like, at your funny faces. <laughs> because it's like, yes, I, like, that's in good. Theory, that's healthy. Yes, in vulnerability. Theory. In action, no in, armor. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like, I can say that I want vulnerability, but I'm like, man, when you look at my action. <laughs> and is that okay? Like, I think. So you, when we were talking about being HSPs, you have so much more experience with like being an HSP and like knowing what that means for you and like the level of armor that's required. Yes. Yeah. Because you sort of have to have like an emotional skin. Like if I don't work to self-regulate and like differentiate myself and like make sure I'm not getting codependent with people, I can like over merge. And that's. And I think in, be, to protect myself from doing that again, I've like kind of gone the opposite direction. And so as we're talking, I'm thinking about like, I need to, I need to find a way to be able to like walk a middle path. Well, and it's pendulating, right? It's, yeah. And you're, you're like learning to walk the middle path, even with your willingness to be on this conversation. You're, you said you were journaling before this to like get ready for it. There's things that are shifting. That's a good way of thinking about it, that it like, the things are shiftable. Sometimes I can get into a very like stuck mindset. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. But like, yeah, you're right. This is all, this is all shiftable stuff. This is all stuff that has been shifting without me, without me. pushing it. So hopefully now that I can like draw a little more awareness to it, I'll be able to like, like, keep shifting it into a place where it's, where it's like balanced and healthy for me. Mm -hmm. So if I remember the main question that we started at the beginning was giving and receiving. How do you know when you're being generous versus being taken advantage of? And I guess this is like definitely a question to keep exploring for myself. But the thing that's coming up right now is, am I giving because I want the two of us to be able to have an experience together? Or am I giving so that I can have my own way? Like when I'm offering to like pay for something, is it because I love your company and I want us to be able to go to this thing? Or is it because I want to go to this thing and I want to be able to, like, tell you that you have to come with me because I paid for it? Like, is it an invitation or is it an order? And do you trust yourself to be able to tell when someone's paying for you and they're demanding something out of it? That is a little trickier for me to discern. Like, with my own behavior, I think I can start to check in with myself and use that as a discerning question with other people i don't know it's it's harder because i can't read their minds as much as i wish i could and yet you can trust i mean one of the things what i'm saying here is like when someone offers to do something for you when matt buys you food can you tell what his ultimate aim is his ultimate aim well it's two things one is he can't resist a good deal He's like, I got a coupon and we're going to use it, baby. And then the other thing is that he wants me to be happy. Like he wants all the brownie points of me being like, you got me food. This is great. I'm so excited. Well, and especially we, we talked about some of your health restrictions, right? It's yes. like getting you food that you love. That's a big deal. That's a it's no small feat. Yes. 
So when you think of other experiences where you've just like people have wanted to be generous with you and you just kind of felt an internal pause, can you think of one? The can you remember one? big? I mean, the biggest one is definitely when I was living with Matt without paying rent. That that is like I that I felt like I had to do stuff to pay it back, or like, or like I guess maybe a more recent example is my partner who lives in Seattle had said like, "Oh, if you come visit me, I'll pay for half of your plane ticket." Because you know, plane tickets are expensive and he wants me to come visit. And then I never asked him to actually follow through on that. Like I bought my own plane tickets because like, I guess. Like, I guess. And yeah, for the, for all of those like blocked up reasons that I was like, well, now it's it's awkward. And like, what if he's changed his mind and I'll just pay for it? Yeah, the vulnerability of bringing out something that he had mentioned. Right, yes, of asking for anything. That was, so here we're not so much talking about his move towards you as like right. your response to the move. Yes. Yeah. Right, because you, because I, when I said like, can you trust yourself to know when someone's trying to manipulate you through gift or they're just being generous? You said, I can't read the other person's mind, which is totally valid. And yet with this other experience with your partner in Seattle, like here they're, they they said something. They didn't follow through on it for whatever reason. They might have forgotten. They maybe they were being un untrue. Like who knows right. why? But I, you could have asked the question, right? And I didn't. Which bonkers. So maybe that's how you would know if people are like, "Why do you want to do this?" You know, like for birthday dinners, it's often because it's your birthday that they <laughs> just want to buy you birthday dinner. For first dates, it's often because they want to see you again that they want to buy you a first date. But someone buys you a car or offers to pay your rent for six months. Like what? Who knows what their motivations are? Each situation will be different. Right. But that's a good point that like I can ask people what their motivations or what their expectations are. And that if someone like makes an offer, I can't. I don't have to pretend that they didn't do that, which is like a weird thing that I'm doing. Well, I mean, yeah. it keeps your armor intact. It does. it does. And it's like, it's, but it's very silly. As I'm hearing myself talk through, I'm like, oh, these are not logical thoughts. Well, we, we're hardly logical. We're That's hardly, true. hardly, hardly illogical. One of the things I love to say, and it's this is from a book called The Psychology of Money, but Morgan Housel said that money looks like math because it's got numbers. But it's much more like psychology. Yeah, I believe that. Absolutely. Yes. And I think even more so for people that are highly sensitive and see so many more connections, because money really is like relationships made manifest in some way. Because I could be over here and be like, this bookmarker is money. Right. And you're going to say, no, no. <laughs> the bookmarker is the bookmarker. <laughs> it's very nice, but it's not legal tender for all debts, public and private. <laughs> There's no government backing right. up that bookmarker. There's a relationship, you know? So if I were to give you money, we know it's money because somebody else is backing it up. There's like many layers of relationship. That's true. That's true. And true. I wonder if some of like, because we're living in just like very anxious times generally and financially anxious times specifically. Mm -hmm. That... Like, I will say I am certainly not in a place of deep trust with the American government. And I think most Americans are not in a place of deep trust with the American government. And I wonder if that's, especially for those of us who are more sensitive, kind of messing with our ability to manage money and relate to money. Because, like, when you have fiat currency, you know, you, you it needs to be backed. It needs to be backed by something. And essentially, it's backed by our trust in the American government, which... Is not at a soup. It's not exactly at an all time high right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with inflation being what it is, it's like it can be very destabilizing. That things that used to cost this amount now cost this amount, and you're like, well, what's going to happen next? Yes, exactly. And these connections are often being made unconsciously, right? We're not pausing to think like, why do I feel this way coming out of the grocery store? Why do the money's conversations feel a little harder? Right. Mm -hmm. But they do. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to generosity and 
the sense of being taken advantage of. Has this conversation brought any clarity? Are there any next steps that feel good to you? I think the clarity that's come from this has just been seeing my own pattern. Because it was definitely, like you said, you can't see the spinach in your own teeth. And I was not aware of the way that I was you sort of using money as armor and the like hidden things that I believed were under the money in terms of like if I accept it, I'm going to have to do whatever they say, stuff like that. So just seeing that pattern and recognizing that it's not logical has been a big point of clarity. And then also having the tools to check in internally by saying, like, am I paying so that we can have an experience together or am I paying so that I can have my own way? For me, that feels like a good next step to like check in with myself about. And then also just to go give Matt a hug. That that feels that feels like a good next step because he's <laughs> he's been very supportive during as I've been figuring all of this out. Yeah, yeah. Because just like a whenever you're in an abusive relationship, healing out of it, there's so many different aspects. There's so many different aspects that need to be healed, and yeah. So good work, Matt, yeah. in assisting with the financial side of it. What about the capacity to tolerate conflict when it comes to money? That is something that I have not built a muscle for. Do you have a need for it right now? Not really. Because Matt and I are, yeah, like I said, we just really see eye to eye and we sort of naturally have like the same kind of like saver mindset and everything. But I think maybe a way that I could risk a little bit of conflict and see what happens is I could remind my Seattle partner of the fact that he said he would pay for half of my ticket. Like, hopefully that won't lead to a conflict. But right now, I'm avoiding conflict in a very silly way. I feel like we covered all the things and that they all came back to each other. It all felt very interconnected and very complete. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be your first podcast guest. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Diana Giselle Yanez. Did you enjoy this episode? Please share this first season of Highly Sensitive Money with others. To learn how you can upskill your money relationship, Join the newsletter over at allthecolors.net. That's A L L T H E C O L O R S dot N E T for network. Take care and remember, you've got what it takes to feel good about your money.